off learning Swedish and I want to hop back on board. It, it's amazing how much Swedish does sound like the Swedish chef. <laughs> yeah, they, cr they crushed it. <laughs> <laughs> Got him, idiot. What's it like, nation? How's it, how's it going, country? How's that affordable health care? Idiots. Silverstein, the compendium of smut and depravity from the creator of <laughs> where the sidewalk ends. I think I found it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he did. I think he did photos and I think he did some writing too. play that song live i actually should i should cover yeah. i should cover everybody's favorite eminem song the venom theme song uh, it's shana's favorite yeah what's well, everybody's favorite it's, it's his best one i forgot i gotta text her right now hold on hold yeah on, no make sure on. make sure you let her know also yeah. while Corey's doing that hi everyone uh welcome to the stream uh what's just up? to keep everybody updated um our playtest uh, is going to be continuing. Uh, unfortunately, we did have uh, kind of a medical issue uh, with one of our playtesters. Just to be clear, everything is fine. Nobody is in any danger, but they are out for this week. Uh, we will be returning, I am assuming, next week, um, but we will give updates on our Twitter um, or other social media channels as that becomes available. Best thing to do right now is to follow our Discord um, to get the most recent updates on what we're doing uh, for upcoming streams and, and any kind of last minute changes. So we apologize if you were turn if you were tuning in, uh, hoping to see the Steve and the Steve the Eviscerator crew. Um, he'll be back, <laughs> uh, but yeah. just just not this week. Um, instead, just uh, not this week. Just not, just, <laughs> just not this weed. <laughs> no, um, weed. 
Yeah. Oh, I thought you said weed. Hold on. Are we saying the same thing? What are we saying? What What are I'm you saying? saying? Weeb? Like anime. Oh, oh, be like Bravo. Yeah, be oh, like okay. Bravo. I did, I did mishear you. I was saying You weed. said weed, right? I did. I said, I said Delta. D like Delta. Cool. How'd you learn to do that? I'm having a weird day, man. Dog, what? <laughs> Hey everybody! Hey guys. Um, so, anyways, uh, what we're doing today is we're just kind of gonna sit down and have a talk about some some of the things that we have noticed uh, just from <laughs> our our few little bits of play testing going into the game, um, and kind of giving a projection for errata you can expect uh, coming up on the website relatively soon, uh, it and also. Be up, but I'm fucking lazy. We're both lazy. Neither of us did it. Um, but um, errata that you should expect up on the website soon. And probably the direction of what we think Vault Peddler's 1E uh, is going to look like. Um, so let's... let's. I want to start, actually, Corey, with just your overall perspective. Now that we have both been GMs of this game... Yeah. Um, what what has been your takeaway from the few sessions, both character creation and our first session was kind of contract negotiation. Um, what have been your overall takeaways of the game? I think that character creation works really well. I think it will work better once we have more lore written into the game. Yeah. Um, as it stands, like we're introducing people to it who maybe haven't read the book at all so like we're explaining everything and then like i'm also doing the gm thing where i'm like what does that mean when you answer that question but i mean cards on the table i think like if you just rip through that bad boy you're done with the character in 15 minutes no problem absolutely um so that that's that's like from character creation that's my biggest takeaway um i did notice uh I, so I noticed that something that, like, when I was making Mike's character with him the other day that I messaged to you, which is, like, our game has become a combat game, and I'm not sure how keen I am on that. Um, yeah. And we spent a lot of time working on combat, and that might be where it happened. Um, yeah. I don't know. I think we overdid it on conditions. and Because like, here's the thing, like... The rest of the game doesn't flow like that. It feel I don't know, but 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 I'm, I'm excited to see how combat works because I think the core structure makes a lot of sense. Um, yeah. But I think that maybe we've gamified too much as far. I don't know. So I've also been like, here's the thing about conditions, right? Like when you are playing, especially like a combat game, and you have a condition that gives you blindness and you're blind for, and like, it ends up being very punitive and it lasts what is essentially the whole turn, the whole game. Like, and then you're out of the combat and when everyone else gets to play and you don't, that seems less fun for people at the table. Or that's at least the response that I get online, you know, looking at things like that. So, yeah, I don't know, maybe like, after we do the play test, we can examine things. Maybe we want to make conditions like one round kind of stuff, that kind of thing. There's definitely like stuff we can play around with that um, could mitigate that. But again, we haven't gotten to that section yet. So yeah. um, I don't no. know, it's just stuff that I noticed on visual. After, after you messaged me about that, I really started thinking about it and I realized that for all of our talk about how D and D is uh, shitty, and and by the way, they are. Fuck you, Wizards of the Coast. Um, yeah. uh, we we have kind of fallen into the same trap that D and D did, where they put all of this emphasis on combat, and yeah. then the social stuff uh, is just <laughs> kind of like there's stuff there for it but it's very bare bones it's very yeah. up to gm fiat it's very up to interpretation um and so my i actually have a uh, had a different takeaway on it which wasn't that we gamified combat too much 
It was that we didn't gamify anything else enough. Um, so, mean, I'm, so I'm really interested in taking like, like L5R does a really great job at gamifying like social intrigue scenes. I'm really yeah. interested to see if we can pull inspiration from that kind of stuff to make things like contract negotiation into this more formalized process um, that, that maybe right now it's lacking that structure. Like we talked about that, um, and I think that that's what contract negotiations are missing. Um, it's it's one of the two things, right? Like you you either lean into mechanics or you lean against them, um, right? At this at this point, so like it, it's it's how do we want to define ourselves? Do we want a rules like ethos? Do we want a trad ethos? Like, and, and what comes aboard that too right because like once you get heavy into mechanics things get crunchy really quick and like even yeah. though it seems like a lot of light mechanics when you have a lot of them and people have to memorize a lot of different systems in tandem that becomes overwhelming yeah um and and, and like that's 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 where you get into those heartbreakers right like uh so uh, like okay me and taylor have been like for our personal game looking at uh, games for the future for both of us yeah. that we're interested in running. Because um, we're, I don't know, planning ahead. And because we've run games around each other, we kind of don't want to do the same thing. Um, and I've been, like, racking my brain about... Well, because you've you've expressed interest in potentially doing science fiction, so I backed yeah. down from sci-fi a little bit. I'm like, all right, cool. What do I? I mean, like, what do I do there? And with with all the wizard stuff going on, I was like, maybe I'll try some fucking fantasy, yeah. um, which I don't do a lot. I, I I mean, I tend to do a lot of like horror and sci-fi. You do a lot sure. of historical and more fantasy stuff, right? Yeah. Like, <clears throat> so I don't know. Um, I, I mean, I, I, anyways, I, I all that to say, like, I found a game that I really want to run, but. It, it ends up getting really, really fiddly from a lot of overlaying systems that I just don't think would work for our table. Yeah. Um, and, like, none of them are, like, over overly complex on their own. Um, but, like, in tandem, a lot of them become so overwhelming. So, like, I'm listening to people play it, and I'm like, well, that's fine, that's fine. I'm like, well, that's a lot to add. Like, that's a hat on a hat on a hat on a hat. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I don't know, like, that that's, like, we're at this impasse right now, where it's, like, how do we... Because combat feels over-mechanized to me, but everything else feels underbaked, I agree. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I don't disagree that certain things we're definitely going to need to try and, like, the, the conditions... <clears throat> uh, in particular, I think I might have made bleeding a little too intense, uh, which I pulled from uh, L5R, but... Um, yeah, no, like there's there's definitely things I think in combat that we it wouldn't hurt for us to pull away from. Yeah. Um, that being said, I think our overall structure, our fundamental, like the foundation that we have in combat, I think <laughs> is very good. Um, I, I agree, and I and I think it's I think it is that way because we um, thought about it a lot and we found a really unique way to do it. And so all, all that I want to do is see if we can find some way to take that foundation and apply it to other things, right? Maybe yeah. maybe doing the same kind of um, uh, shootouts um, mm. for contract negotiation um, to, to determine that. Maybe, maybe taking that framework and putting it into something... Um, that right now our game is really lacking, which is which yeah. is that social combat, uh, uh, that which, social combat. Which is scene. inherently a very difficult thing. Social combat always gets decried as shitty in games, uh, and like L five R does it really well, and they're one of the few that I think gets the accolade. Yeah, um, it, it's tough. Um, yeah. So, I mean, I agree with you. I would like to do it with the same framework that we are currently working on. I don't necessarily know how that would look with our initiative system, though, especially because contracts tend to be... Um, unless you were to, like, abstract things and, like, actually have, like... Uh, <laughs> actually have, like, instead of 
individuals um, like have things that you want in the contract acting as like um, like enemy combatants basically so like things that they have are like the pieces on the board and things oh, that you want oh interesting yeah like that that might be a way to do it with the uh initiative system that we have in place and like yeah. quite literally have like a skirmish uh, on the on the con which which I think would be be like, neat. novel yeah I don't <laughs> think anybody I don't think anyone else I don't think anyone else is doing that like no. so there's so we've got that going for us which is nice <laughs> which is nice um, um but yeah, they no, it's a... it's cool to see that we're we're both at least kind of on the same page. I know that we've yeah. talked about this a couple of times. Um, so like, that's definitely something that uh, viewers can expect in like the errata and whenever we do get like the first edition completely out. Definitely expect to see some kind of more formalized process uh, yeah. for what the contract negotiation section is going to look like. Um, because I think we have the beginnings of an idea for formal there too. Like we yeah. talked about doing flow down and stuff. It's just, you know. We've talked about doing flow down. The other thing we've talked about, and this is something that it's in the book, but it's not on the contract sheet, which I think it would really help if it was. Um, a lot of the times what we found is that because this is a fictional world and we have a fictional currency system with a fictional economy, a lot of people really don't understand just how bad the deals being offered actually yeah. are. Um, so like if you look in our book, there's like a whole thing about like, you know, one petty coin is like docking fee for a city. It's like rations for your party for a day. It's the cost of a day's travel, so on and so forth. Um, and like, there'll be contracts where you're working for like a week and it's like three petty coin. So like, yeah, it's like a single day's worth of stuff. Um, so with that in mind, um, one of the other things I want to, uh, see at least as far as our like physical assets, I want to see those resources put into the, um, uh, put actually onto the contract sheet. Yeah. So that way, even if players are brand new to this world, they don't know jack all about like EBA and like the economy and all that, they can still look at that graph and say like, oh, they're paying us two petty coin. That's going to last us literally a day. Um, <clears throat> we also have a list of helpful questions to get players started, which I think if we are going to mechanize that process, that is also a really useful place to start. Maybe, me maybe finding a way to mechanize those questions um, that we have in that section. Oh yeah, yeah, and, yeah, and, yeah, and and making that into some kind of a turn order. I don't know. Yeah, that, but, that's what I'm saying. Like 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 an actual flow down that like yeah. you go down and you follow. That, that that's probably. I think we need that kind of direction. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, that being said, I think you're right, though, that like a currency and economy is supposed to be important to this game. So we need to like be much more upfront about it. And yeah. like, it, it needs to be like we need to be referencing petty coin more frequently in the book. We need to be talking about like its evaluation more currently, like more concretely. Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't we know. also we also need to, I think, write a little bit more about um about how it is expected that uh, not just players, but that characters, uh, that vault peddlers in universe would negotiate over these things. Because what I found with both of the playtest groups that we're running right now is that they were really, uh, what's the word? Uneasy, I guess. Uh, unsure about whether or not to even, like, I don't want to say something to this NPC because. I don't want to anger them or whatever. I don't want to make it worse. Um, yeah. We we should include, I think, a lot more, um, you know, whether it's flavor boxes, uh, whether it's uh, narrative text, whatever, uh, that really indicates that negotiation is not only something you can do, it's expected. It's like a part of the game. Um, I, I don't wonder if... Um a good way to sell the value of petty coin would be to remove the tag and die that you get from um, 
from caravan creation and instead hmm. trade it out for petty coin like you can buy this die with this many petty coin to add to rolls like that way it's a very concrete like as a meta currency you know how much you can like this is a petty coin is worth because it's you know one petty coin's worth a d12 and i only have two of those fuckers to roll on most oh, of my rolls yeah that is a neat idea basically just burn a petty coin to roll an extra dice <coughs> yeah well just like get yeah basically like yeah those yeah. are your caravan resources you got it and like then you can still have that table resources of, of a pile of dice on the table just yeah. replace them with like poker chips of petty coin and like yeah. two of these are id8 you know um, yeah, but and it would also get us to the point where players could add a D four immediately, like upon playing, instead of having to work up to it by just like spending all their fucking cash on it. Right, um, or or by so, or by like be, being paranoid when it doesn't make sense for them to do that. Yeah, I actually and, I like that idea a lot because I think I that because I think one thing that we ran into a lot, um, not just even with these two playtest groups, but with earlier ones, was they yeah. really didn't understand like okay, so like the tag for some reason generates petty coin. Why is it attached to the caravan? Like yeah. why isn't it something that's attached to like my player? Um, or like why why don't we have like a different tag for every you know, for everybody on here. Um, yeah. And because I know those questions came up um, at least a couple of times between like all of the different play tests that we've done. And that would be a really elegant solution and it would get them to yeah. care a lot more about that, about that make resource. Give a shit more about resource management. That's for fucking sure. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it would definitely make, uh, <laughs> it would definitely make going into the game with zero petty coin a lot less appealing because yeah. i'll tell you this for all of the players i've made and i want to talk about that in just a second but for all of the players i've made i have always burnt all five of my petty coin like you know customizing cool gear and like getting items and all that yeah no i know i know not everyone has yeah. Um, but Mike I know for and Derek very specifically knew that tags cost money to to use it, and they're like, yeah. I want to use the cool item that I made, so I'm saving petty coin to do so. Yeah, no, I mean that that was very cool. Um, uh, I do want to talk about uh, character creation, though. Um, so in the last couple of weeks, I've made like three different characters, um, yeah. and uh, go, going to your original point about character creation. You're absolutely right. If you know this system, if you know what you're doing, I can crank out a character in like 10 minutes. Yeah. It's, and like, it's a character that, um, I mean, we've, we've talked a lot about like the narrative, uh, stuff, uh, that like you can build a really cool narrative character with a really rich background in very few steps and like just A, B, C, D, whatever. Um, I did want to, um, approach the idea of adding in maybe one or two questions, um, to the, uh, character creation process, because as of right now, we only have, um, two questions in the whole thing that affects your approaches. Yeah. I feel like it should at least be three. Um, I don't know. Like here, I I don't know, because here's the thing. When you hit, like, right now when somebody has a D8 in something, everyone's like, whoa, look yeah. this guy. And, like, I don't know, the, the fact that it's sparse like that does provide something at the table. Yeah. Um, it gives us something to build to. I, I don't know. I don't disagree. I don't agree. Like, it's I, I'm, I'm kind of neutral on the subject. Yeah. Um, it, it's, it's something that, like, I could see pulling back against, though. Um, yeah. Yeah. The other thing I was, oh, I was thinking about something. Um, a lot of people complain about death spirals because they, you you know, as you go more, the worse you get. And it people play conservatively. It stops being fun. And then yeah. we saw that Alien does the opposite with the stress mechanic. And it does a lot of good for the game, right? Like you want to take on stress because a little bit more stress makes it so you can do a little bit better. So it's like the management. I wonder if, the, and maybe this, I think there is a way to do this if we got rid of conditions or something. Mm. Um, but 
if there's a way that like when you take wounds um you get like uh, oh a, a bonus instead of a instead of a negative um but the balance being that it like removes a per like permanently removes a skill or an approach the only thing I'm going to worry about with that is people don't like when things get taken off their character sheets very much. But if you constantly have, like, these bonuses that are stacked for taking damage, that might well, mitigate it. Here's here's what I'm going to say. Um, if you do – I don't even think you need to have the extra, um, the extra things that are taken off because what, it's four wounds and you're dead, yeah. right? Yeah. So like yeah. if I, if I'm taking three, if I've taken three <laughs> wounds and I, you know, get these like approach, like bonuses to my approaches or whatever, as I'm kind of going down, um, I mean, I'm still going to be worried as I get to that third wound, right? As, yeah. as I see those wound nodes going towards death, start to ratchet up as well. I'm going to be, I'm still going to be nervous. I'm still going to be playing conservatively. Um, yeah. it's Bye, just, Winnie, I love you. It's just something that I'm going to be a little bit more, uh, I'm, I'm going to have at least like more of a sense of hope and I'll be more enticed to do cool shit and, and to take chances. Yeah. So I actually, I love that idea. I love the idea that as you take wounds, you apply, you know, uh, it, like the oh, next, like the that. next die type up, um, I mean, I think we can just keep it simple, right? Like do you just get a plus one. Uh, your dice pools expand, right? I, sure. I think that would be, the, yeah, I think that would be like the the reason. That's just basically how we've been doing improvements with things, right? Like, yeah. Just expand a dice pool, it seems like the easiest way to do it. Um, but, but, I mean, we definitely want some kind of internal balance. Like, I think why alien stress mechanic works so well is because, like, you want to take a little bit of stress, but taking too much means that you're going to fucking fail. So maybe it, like, maybe it does make it easier to die. Maybe, like, we take that pain maybe, condition may, and apply. May, maybe on the third wound, maybe it, like, once you once you hit that level, maybe it becomes it becomes an issue then. Yeah, I, or I mean, maybe we just take maybe we take some of the like conditional things that we have and just like apply those conditions while still giving you like the cart like the increased bonuses. So you're like doing this little balance game. Where, yeah, you know it's harder to stay alive. But yeah, yeah. I don't know. It, it, I, I like the idea of a reverse death spiral. Uber Uber Mouser brings up a good point. I mean, these are changes that we're going to be making over time. I absolutely yeah. agree. Like we're not we're not rushing to these changes by any stretch oh. of the imagination. Um, uh, health impacts and potential explosion option, but it's still resourced. To, yeah, yeah. Well, and that's that's kind of what we're talking about. Alien does this. Uh, so we were. I was. I played the Alien RPG over um, over at PAX, and they do this thing with stress, and you can opt to take stress, and stress just adds die to your die pool but those dice have chances of failure on them. So you want a little bit of stress because like, otherwise it's very difficult to do things. And it's supposed to represent the idea that like, you're fucking, you're running on adrenaline. Now. You're like a little amped up, but because you're a little amped up, you can fuck up. <laughs> yeah. Um, but but I think, I don't know. I, I, I think that I would like to move into that direction. Um, yeah. Yeah. No, I, I really love the idea. I love, um, and I think that it's a really elegant solve, um, for having, if we do keep it with only two questions that affect approaches, I think that that's a good way to balance that out. Um, where, you know, it, you can fail, but you're, you're going to have bonuses as you get weaker, so on and so yeah. forth. I think, I think that that's a good way to, keep the kind of ethos of a brutal world, but like you're still a very special person in it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, um, oh, I wanted to talk about something. Yeah. You mentioned on the first play test that you thought rolling was successes was very easy. I did. And 
And I wonder how you feel about it after last night. Where we yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, um, I, it was, a, that's absolutely true. Um, and here's the thing. I mean, we've, we've played on roll 20 for years and, um, sometimes man, roll 20 just has it out for a, for a group where you're either just rolling, you know, super high or you're just rolling absolute garbage all night. And clearly, I mean, what happened on our Wednesday group was they were rolling what would normally be garbage, but in our case, you want to roll low. So they were rolling really well and there wasn't like a single, you know, or, or there were, I think, two or three failures over the course of the whole night. Tuesday night. Holy shit. Uh, <laughs> very different. Can I tell you what I think the difference was? Yeah. I was putting stress uh, outside stressors on things, so yeah. making it two rolls because he doesn't trust you. Um, and, and the minute I added like an extra success, it worked really well. So I, I think it kind of works the way it's intended, right? Like if yeah. you're doing something just straight up, yeah, it's pretty fucking easy. You're an adventurer, you can do it. But the minute things start to get complicated, which which brings us back actually to the initial ethos of this game which is a heist um the yeah. minute things start to like break apart up, yeah. yeah exactly um it becomes hard um yeah so i don't know I, I i thought it i thought it was a neat example of the game working yeah no i i completely agree no my <clears throat> my mind my mind on that has changed uh at least for now i mean we'll yeah. we'll see We'll see as we go through both of these play tests the whole way through. Obviously, there's a lot of roles to come, but man, um, it was like night and day between the two groups. Um, uh, what's this? Um, how about tie it to the caravan? Benefits and negatives. Uh, benefits and negatives from dispatch can be affected. Leans into your strengths or it sucks. So trust your team. Um... I'm sorry. Uh, I'm not sure I understand. Uh, tie what to the caravan? I think um, he means tying the. Uh, tie, well, tying, tying. Like the benefits for damage. Oh, that might. Yeah, that. Yeah. That that does make a lot of sense. Okay, yeah. So benefits and negatives from dispatch can be affected. Sorry, there's kind of thoughts. Sick. Chat is delayed. <laughs> the effects that the game are part of the death spiral. Um, that yeah. might be an interesting way to do it, actually. Like, have um, have you guys decide what the... Actually, maybe that's it, right? Like, you decide what happens on a caravan level because of, like, the kind of team you are when you start taking damage. Call it, like, you guys planning ahead. Call it, like, that heist shit, right? Like, what happens if Johnny goes down? Well, then, uh, Timmy has to take up the that shield in order to yada, yada, yada. So, like, it's plan and mitigation stuff, um, which actually would make a lot of sense and bring the caravan into regular combat because now it's, like, our jobs and how we handle it when things go wrong. It's our, uh, we could even, oh, we could call it like our, uh, what, what do you call it when a, a plan that in like case a, things fuck up? Backup, fail safe. Uh, yeah. Yeah, call, call them fail safes or something like that, where like whenever you take a wound level, like fail, like a fail safe or, a, you know, gets, gets unlocked, which, would provide you with whatever bonus we're talking about, whether that be a flat bonus or uh, or something decided upon at the different caravan levels or um, negatives. I don't yeah, know. no, that's a neat idea. Like, I, I like <clears throat> the idea because we uh, at the same time that we're taking theoretically that we're taking away like tags and stuff from caravans. Yeah, we want to make sure that we still give the caravan teeth. Um, yeah. So I, I yeah, do well, like it. We want to tie everything together too with it, right? Like, yeah. Uh, so having, if we remove... having play tested the game, I always feel disconnected from the caravan. I see the shift to using it as a vehicle from when we used it uh, and combat. And it's a great start, but it needs to be integral. That's where the dice pool idea came from. Yeah. yeah. Um, that's, I think that's exactly what we're hitting on here. Like, yeah. The uh, I I want to make sure that the caravan feels important because narratively it is narratively yeah. the caravan is supposed to be the lifeblood of the vault peddler crew, 
Um, <clears throat> So I don't know. Um, I think that tying that to the caravan is maybe a more realistic way, a more practical way um, that makes that makes more sense than having a really abstracted like die generation tag yeah. um, that we currently have on it. I don't know. It would also make like we could do. I don't know. We could tie like dispatch questions or something to it. Like they're your planner or like dispatch is supposed to be the guy on the phone, right? Yeah. Guy. Um, it's, it's Oracle behind the screens. Right. Yeah. So like if we were to tie the different wound levels to like the questions that you answered with dispatch and they were them being positive things. And then we have like this net negative running whenever you take a wound, like um, maybe maybe that's it, right? Then yeah. we'd be able to flesh out dispatch a bit more. Everyone would have their own instead of it just kind of being this floating thing that every that they're all the same, right? Yeah. Oh, uh, Ubermaster, that's a great idea. As far as reserve petty coin goes, maybe offer benefits for having certain benchmark amounts. Uh, that yeah. would be a really cool way to look at character advancement. Uh, <sighs> like. Oh, I don't know. Yeah. Like once you hit a certain amount in your in your reserves, like let's say you fill your bank all the way up, um, you know, well, one I mean, of that one would bring or... us to our initial idea, right? Like yeah. everything we're talking about here is bringing petty coin back to where we had it, which was petty coin. Like we've since brought it into just kind of being like an in-world currency, but in reality, like we initially started it as currency, meta currency, and possibly experience and. We talked about bringing it back to meta currency just earlier, and now yeah. what Uber Mouser is saying is 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 essentially putting it back into the realm of experience. Well, I mean, here's the thing: um, one of the things that we have narratively in world discussed about Petty Coin is that it does have these mm. like advancement properties. Um, yeah. So who's to say that once you have so many Petty Coin all up in uh, one space? that one of them gets onto your skin and suddenly you can jump a little bit higher. Suddenly you yeah. can speak, you can think a little bit more quickly. Sometimes like I, I, I kind of like that idea cause it, we've already established that it is kind of a meta currency in addition to an in world currency. And I think actually using that as the basis for advancement is a really solid, seamless way to do that. I, my question is, is, is it, is it a static change or is it a variable change? Like once you dip back below 25, do you lose that uh, benefit? And it's only if you have uh, this amount of petty coin in here, do you yeah. get to like, that way you can like, you have your base scores and then you can like shop around and move things around once you've got a certain amount of petty coin. Yeah. Um, it's it's a it's a that's like a really good question because I like the idea of it being a permanent thing because I really like the idea that this is the other reason that regular people hate vault peddlers. It's not that they carry uh petty coin around. It's that in some cases they are actually like made of petty coin. They're actually yeah. they actually have absorbed petty coin. Um, which makes just them at all being around dangerous. Um, that being said, uh, what happens when it goes down below? I have mm -hmm. no idea. I mean, this is this is the very early stages of proposing that concept. So I have no I clue. Actually, I agree with what Uber is saying here. These are all pretty big changes, but if we bring back Petty Coin as something that, like, instead of having, you know, the die generating tag, it's Petty Coin that you can spend. Um, although that does change some things, um, because we have currently, you can have five Petty Coin on you. Yeah. Um, and if we have it, like, I mean, even if it's in the bank, like, um, in the bank in your caravan you just have access to it somehow like so i have a soul credit card whatever the fuck you want to call it like <laughs> um e either way it does kind of change things right like yeah absolutely like, like narratively um bigger wallet you can invest in we're gonna make a petty coin stock market <laughs> <laughs> well, but then we're moving away from in the we're moving away from communal back to individuality, right? Like I like the idea that like you get these flat bonuses from the caravan by stocking your fucking um by stocking yeah. your 
in your per your bank, right? Like by stocking the improved bank, and you guys are putting petty coin in there and getting those bonuses up. Meanwhile, you want to bring petty coin with you because you could spend petty coin on dice. Um, yeah, that you can add to roll. Um, taking too many, and maybe that's what it is. Like maybe maybe like um, there is like some sort of phase like where you can like. It, it is a dimensional wallet that reaches into the um, reaches into the bank, pulls it out. But you know, you take too many. What I really like about the interplay here is that if you spend too many on dice, you lose those bonuses that you had. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I, I like that as an advancement option, honestly. Yeah. Um, I like that quite a bit. So let me, uh, obviously advancement's a huge uh, topic that we need to go more into. That's that's something that we don't even have play testing for available yet. Um, let's, let's go back to stuff that we are play testing for. I'm interested to know, um, what did you think of the new GM tools? I know that uh, in private, you've been telling me how much you love them, but I am hoping to get more of a, a little bit more detail on the record um, sure, for how yeah. using I mean, they're, those they're, does. They're fucking great. Um, they're really easy. Um, I mean, maybe it's because we designed them and I helped design them and I know how I prep games. Um, but when I prep games, like I look for, like I, I make a list of NPCs, I make a list of maps that I'm gonna need and areas and then like knowledge that you might find. This condenses all of that, and it's all modular, right? Like, the contract lets me know the areas that you might encounter, which brings up a cat sheet. The cat sheet tells me the folks and factions that are in that area. Bingo, bango, I grab my fucking NPC cards, and they all feed into each other. What I really like are the cat sheets. Um, now, part of this is, like, we haven't really gotten into combat, and I'm happy, I'm, I'm very happy to see how, like, our combat works. Yeah. But the gear and opportunity and knowledge and information sections are great. Because anytime a player wants to investigate something, there are many situations when I am GMing, where I'm like, well, that doesn't really make sense that they'd find, like, now I can just be like, yeah, you find this. Because, like, I know that that information is in that area. Yeah. So, like, if you want to investigate this guy and you're doing something clever, instead of fucking bogarting that information from you, I'm going to be like, yeah, that fucking makes sense that you'd find it there. And I got it all listed right here. I sure. really like the uh, GM tools. I think it's the strongest part of our game. Yeah. No, I, I had a similar experience as I was using, because I didn't get to use this version of Cats. That's my dad. Lilac Basilisk is your dad? Well, yes. Like your actual sort of. dad. No. Your but Twitch yes. dad. <laughs> no, he's, he's used to be a bartender. All right. Well, he's my dad. Hey, dad. How are you? My, bro my brother's a brick. It got confusing for a little while. I'm yeah, I imagine. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like it. <laughs> glad, to have, glad to have you with us, Lilac Basilisk. Um, it's your dad. Uh, hey, Dad. Um, yeah, no. So I, I had similar experiences um, working with older models of it. Uh, so I, I know that one of the things I struggled with was, uh, and and this I think just goes to us preparing games uh, a little bit differently, referring to things with a different vernacular. I was using the sheets in some ways um, where like. I forget like um, something like the cat's sheet had uh, a section that had, I think like purpose on it. Um, and I was using that completely not the way it was intended. Um, so I, I think that I'm curious if we can get somebody else who is not familiar with these, uh, <clears throat> with these tools um, to GM a session I'm curious to see how they will take to that. Can I tell you one thing I really, really like about our cat sheets and yeah. our NPC cards? They have a look and a description section. Yeah. Uh, and for somebody who often forgets to describe things in games, <laughs> it's really nice to have like, oh, how does it look here? Right, here you go, guys. It's it's like, it's shitty or whatever. Anyways. Yeah. <laughs> No, absolutely. Um, 
Like that's that actually was one of my favorite things about the cat's sheet. Um, because for me, I, I usually tend to stray away from having like pre-written descriptions and all that stuff. I'll usually, I'll usually just have like a sentence on like sight, sound, smell, touch, whatever. So like, I know it's grimy. I know it's dusty. I know there's a lot of people in this bar and I know it smells like booze and vomit. Um, but like beyond that, but the thing is that section on the cat sheet is perfectly sized to have that information there um and nothing else um yeah. where where i'm gonna you know spend way too much time describing this thing and you know my whole table has fallen asleep um so i was i was excited to see you using those um and as somebody who is spectating one play test and playing in another i mean it it seems it, i get the impression that it's working um and they're great. I mean, like, yeah. it's, they're they're great and they're easy to fill out. Here, here's another thing. I don't like prepping. Yeah. <laughs> Fair. I don't want to write things. I don't want to do anything. Most of the time, I want to look at a wall, um, and that's like my that's my big enjoyment in life. <laughs> yeah. Um, so anything that gets me there quicker, honestly. No, I mean, like, I, I spend a lot of time to prep, and and I probably spend a lot of needless time doing needless prep. Um, yeah. This streamlines things for me. I mean, I told you, like, I made two adventures. I mean, I, I have my adventures for the month done, and I did it in an hour. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, like, that's tight. NPC cards are fucking wicked easy. I love the NPC let me, cards. Let me ask so you this. Tight. Because we do have instructions in the book on how to make an NPC on the fly. Have, did you do that at any point during these playtests? I haven't had to, because but, but I've been using the instructions to build the NPCs that I built. Yeah. Um. So yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah. I I am curious to see how um, NPC construction on the fly would look. Uh, if you want to just keep that in your back pocket, I'll uh, try. But I pre I over prepare. I mean, fair. That's, yeah. I know who you guys are going to talk to. <laughs> Not anymore. <laughs> um, all right, cool. Um, well, so yeah, so obviously we don't have too much more to talk about today. Um, we've already talked a good bit about character so creation. Long. We've talked about contract negotiation and we've talked about GM resources. Um, was there anything else you wanted to cover? Let's talk about fucking hate Wizards of the Coast. Yeah, by all means, man. Go go in. Fuck them. Fuck them. <laughs> I, I know, mean, I know. Here's I've the thing. I've basically been saying it anyway. <laughs> here's the thing. I know we started uh, this stream by regularly making, like, shitty fuck you Chris Perkins jokes. And Chris yeah. Perkins is totally fine. I have no ill will towards him. But in all seriousness, fuck Wizards of the Coast. Um, yeah, man. Yeah, no, that's it's your fucking new, garbage. Your newest statement's even worse. It, it's it's a pretty clearly defined way. Like, hey, yeah. we're listening to you. We're gonna set up things. Like, first off, you already did it. I already know that like you can revoke this OGL at any time, and you're going to. Yeah, like that's your plan. I know it because fucking capital protects capital, baby. That's what it does. Yeah. Um, and you've already proven that you are willing to do it. You just got caught this time. Yeah. Like. You're, and now you're going to try to direct people to like fill out forms to tell us our complaints. Yeah, right. You want us to scream into a void instead of screaming out loud. Yeah. We'll make my complaints heard out loud. And I'm going to encourage everyone I know not to play those games. I'm never going to buy their products again. I'm going to encourage every creator I know who's thinking of publishing under OGL to publish instead under a different license, yep. work with different people. And yep. I'm only going to recommend, and I do recommend games quite a bit, uh, to <laughs> games that are not Wizards of the Coast games. It, in fact, I will still have my 5e games and my 5e books. I will not lend them out to anyone. <laughs> <laughs> just, to, just to be petty. Um, yeah, no, I mean, like, we've been, we've been talking on this stream for a really, really long time about how, like, there are other games besides D&D &D, um, that you should explore. Um, yeah. One of the best things uh, that has come out of, like, my friendship with Corey is that when we started playing games together, you were like hard nosed about like, let's explore other games. Let's do other stuff. 
that yeah. and and like for me that's that was my introduction to TTRPGs and being where we are now and seeing what Wizards is doing to people who have been making content for them for fucking years yeah, I could not I could not be more grateful to be working on an independent game right now than be like working on some like D and D five E uh, uh, stuff and like pouring my soul into this shit and wondering if I'm ever going to be able to make a living doing it. That yeah. fucking sucks. Um, I, I don't really know what else to say beyond just echoing what Corey's already said. Look into other systems. Like if there, if there was ever a time to explore other games, I don't give a fuck if you play vault peddlers. I'd love it if you did, but honestly, there are so many great games out there. Um, look in, look into L five R play. If you want fantasy play pathfinder, like just do anything else at this point. Um, because this is a company it's a perfect example of a company that's gotten too fucking big for its own good. Um, and it's long overdue for a fall. So also, I'll say this much. I know one other tabletop role playing game company that were doing really well and pulled some fucking shit like this. And <laughs> that company was called TSR. And you know what <laughs> fucking happened? Fucking Wizards of the Coast fucking took over. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So so that's that's our that's our final takeaway. Play other games, explore other games. If you want suggestions for other games, hey, Let's come talk about other games right now. Yeah, come and talk. Okay, yeah, sure. No, I'm down. I was going to say come and talk to Corey and I. You can like you can email us. Um we we have like an email that's on our website at tgsgames.com. Uh, you can find us on Instagram or Twitter, whatever. Reach out to us and tell us what you're looking for. We will be happy to recommend you something that isn't going to try and fuck you over for having a good time and playing a game with your friends. Elle um, called me a hipster the other day. Yeah, fair. <laughs> Did you see that? No, I didn't. Oh, 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 I gotta find it. <laughs> but, that, but that's very good. Um, uh, let me see. Hold on. Also, did you see my cyber cat? I showed you my cyber I, cat. Yeah, right? I saw the cyber cat. Yeah. <laughs> let's, let's smoke drugs. Let's cyber, cyber drugs. drugs. Um, uh, yeah, so L picked up, um, my man uh, picked up uh, Cyborg, which looks really cool. Um, it look, like, I mean, it's, it's more Borg, but cy <laughs> uh, cyberpunk. So, yeah. like, you know, it's dripping with style, baby. Uh, I also have another thing to bring up mechanically about Vault Peddlers. But oh, we'll yeah, go for it. Okay. Uh, but I said, yeah, OSR stuff is cool, but I always worry about how long I can sustain regular games with it. Have you ever used Crawford's Adventure and Generation Tools and Stars Without Number? They're a great place to start idea generation, though they aren't specifically cyberpunk. God, it looks beautiful. Uh I just laid back Dragonbane, which is the English version of Drakkar Octaminar, uh, that Free League is making. It's a D20 BRP with some Year Zero flair thrown in for flavor. It's not traditional. I'm not a traditional fantasy guy, but I wanted to play Treadvane Chronicles, uh, but I think it's too crunchy for my table. So I'm going to pull what I, whatever not, narrative nods I can and port them over. To which L responded, you know all the cool hipster RPGs. Yeah, fair. Um, I ex honestly, I expect nothing less from you <laughs> after knowing you as long as I have. Um, yeah, no, man. Like if you want fantasy, uh, again, Pathfinder is like the easiest port over. Um, if you want something that's like more narrative or whatever, Dungeon World is super easy to pick up. It's very easy. It's very narrative based. Um, I would actually recommend looking through any PBTA stuff if that's more what your table likes. Um, are we, sorry, we are recommending games or are we going back into Vault okay. Peddlers? Uh, let's talk about games. Um, All right. Yeah, sure. Uh, I did wanna, the only thing I wanted to say about Vault Peddlers is oh, maybe yeah. we should take, there's a condition system for items in, um, in death in space that I think would actually apply to vault peddlers really, really well, especially if we're leaning more into the finance side of things. Um, All right. Sick. Yeah. Yeah. No, yeah, we can yeah. absolutely check that out. Free league's fucking crushing it right now. Um, yeah. They, they're doing the one ring, right? The, and the alien game. Yeah, that, 
That that is Free League. They did Alien. Yeah. Uh, they just did Blade Runner. Uh, they have Mutineer Zero. Uh, well, so they have the whole Year Zero engine, which a lot of their games run on. So like Coriolis is on the Year Zero engine. Yeah. Actually, um, are they Forbidden Lands? Yes, they are Forbidden Lands. So Forbidden oh, yeah, Lands. So what up? Forbidden Lands uses the actually, the artist in Forbidden Lands that they use. Uh, it is the artist from the, the original artist for uh drakar ak Damonar, which is like this uh brp um dungeons and swedish like swedish interpretation of yeah. what dungeons and dragons would have been um so yeah. yeah i know i know everybody talks about like oh but like D stuff is so nicely made are they fucking leather bound books Hell Are they yeah. fucking leather bound goddamn books that would look so pretty on your fucking shelf? Like, this is so much better. It's nicer. Um, yeah, man. I, I, well, I'm, I'm also, I'm really, so I picked up, I, I backed Dragon Bend, uh, which is also going to be, um, it, it is more of a, uh, like a BRP game, which basic role playing is what like like Mithras and RuneQuest are. Yeah. Except it's not D one hundred, it's a D twenty variant, so just you know, divide everything by five basically. Um uh, I think it's gonna share some blood with uh Forbidden Lands. Um but it, it's the it's the first time it's been like an, an actual English variant. I guess Trudvang was, but that is a der derivation from the original rule set. This is too, but in a more stream, uh, like it's just a modern approach. The old rule set. Yeah. Um, oh, but they're do how they're selling it is really fucking cool. It's going to be a box um, with all soft cover things inside of it. So you're gonna have a book of adventures and then the rule set soft cover books in a box with like dice and shit. It's, it's going to be an 80s box all right and it's it's yeah it's just really cool that they're doing that like it, it feels old school and fun yeah no that's dope as hell um i'll also uh put out there that um if you're looking for sci-fi related stuff um our table has played um uh stars without number um which we played for quite a while it was very cool um I never got to see the GM tools uh, for that game because Corey ran it. Um, but from what I hear, like the, the faction system is very in-depth. It allows you to create really cool, very unique worlds that I know for me as a player um, translated into very neat stories. Um, uh, I would also say if you're more in like the near future universe uh, looking for sci-fi stuff, uh, Shadowrun is notoriously very, uh, very crunchy. It's, it's not cool. It's notoriously kind of wild. Um, but from what I hear, uh, doing like run faster or shadow run anarchy condenses a lot of that down and makes the game a lot more, a lot more fun and a lot more enjoyable for kind of casual gamers. Um, we've also been running cyberpunk for the last year, cyberpunk red and that game fucking rips. It's tight as hell. Um, it's it's very fun. Mike Pondsmith is the goat forever. Um, yeah. Mikey. Hell yeah. Um, oh, yeah. I don't... I'm sure this isn't Wizards, but um, uh, at PAX, I actually really enjoyed... We played the old Star Wars D6 game. Uh, yeah, that's explicitly not wizards yeah that shit was fun as hell um i fucking great wasn't it yeah it was really good <laughs> yeah <laughs> no i would dig playing that again uh west end games star wars is 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 really cool yeah um it still holds up it's still got a huge following um I think they released it as like because they lost the Star Wars license, so they've just got like a generic sci-fi kind of thing going on yeah. now. But it is it is essentially the same thing. Uh, yeah. The only place I see it break is when you have like mixed party of like force users and non-force users. It can it. I mean, the community's a little split on whether or not it breaks. Uh, yeah. From what I understand, um, Fantasy Flight works a little better for like mixed party stuff 
uh, their Star Wars thing. I don't know. I I, I, I do want to play their Star Wars game. I'm, I'm, Star Wars I'm interested. Again. I'm interested in trying uh, the Fantasy Flight Star Wars. I I'm actually really interested in learning. Uh, in learning one of these fantasy flight systems as a player, because obviously I've been running L5R uh, for the last year. Um, on that note, if you're looking for something that is like East Asian fantasy, or if you just want a game that isn't all about fighting, but is like, we talked a lot about like social combat and stuff like that, and really tense narrative scenes that like have cool mechanics behind them. Legend of the Five Rings fucking kicks ass at that shit. Um, it's really good. Um, the biggest warning I would give is that sometimes it can fall into maybe dangerous levels of Orientalism. The book tries its best to warn people about that, but there are certain things that it, certain tropes that it does fall into. So you need to be wary of those things if you're going to run a game like that. Um, that being said, I, I absolutely back the mechanics in L5R. Um, it is, it is a profoundly fun game and it's been very fun to run. It's also got tons of lore and tons of errata, um, that you can use to like make a world instantly feel large and big and, and three dimensional, um, <laughs> my my players don't necessarily know this, but I'm just going to go ahead and say it here. Uh, they have a whole fucking wiki. They have a whole Wikipedia that like, I know that. if you're, if your players go to a fucking city, um, I can pull up the Wikipedia of that city and be like, oh yeah, there's this in or like this notable character lives there. And I have a whole Wikipedia page that like tells me all about that person. Um, and you can use those resources to your advantage. It's really, really useful. Um, L5R, yeah, can't recommend it enough for what it is. Absolutely look into that if that's kind of the angle that you're that you're going down. I'd like to point out that I know exactly where that wiki is. I just only use it to know about Scorpion. Scorpion <laughs> Fair. stories. I appreciate I appreciate you being a good player and not metagaming. Oh no, it's uh, not about that. It's just they only give a shit about telling Scorpion story. <laughs> yeah, fair. Yeah, uh, uh, just just I want to put this on the record. Whoever wrote like the lore for like the Scorpion Clan? Yeah. Where well, are, where are you? Can you come back, please? <laughs> you, like the the lore for the Scorpion Clan in L5R is arguably some of the best TTRPG related material I've ever seen. Um, it's very good. Uh, so yeah, no, can't again. Sorry, I already said it, but say it again. Can't recommend L5R highly enough. I have a game to recommend. Yeah. Uh, because I had an interesting experience at PAX where me and Taylor were trying to sign up for the one ring yeah. and <laughs> it filled up as like, I don't know. I was right there with him, but for some reason I just did not get it. I was, I was, was a tough. millisecond quicker. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the, the spots filled up really fast, but I was like, so Taylor was gone. And I was like, what the fuck am I going to do? So I'm like looking at open tables, looking for signups. And I was like, I don't know any of these games, but then I was like, well, I'll just sign up for a random one. I was like, I have no idea what it is. Uh, I've never heard of this game. It's called never going home. Never oh, going home. Yeah. Is possibly one of the coolest games. I, I was at a table with five strangers and we had maybe the best time I've ever had at a table. Yeah. Um, it is a World War One horror game uh, where, like, you're balancing the horrors of war with eldritch horrors, and it is phenomenally well done. Uh, character creation, very quick. It takes, like, five minutes, not even, um, because, and that's important, your character's going to die. And when your character dies, you become someone else in the attaché who was just kind of in the background before, and now they're, like, a main character. Um, <clears throat> so you rip through characters. It's a wicked good time. Uh, and so, like, I went up to the booth. I met the guy. I was like, yo, I love your game. He gave me a deal on all the books. He gave me an extra book for free, um, which is super cool. Um, yeah, man, I, I love it. You, like... You, like, give up things, like, memories or, like, physical objects in order to do better in a game, but it's, like, you giving up 
treasured, valuable things about who you are as a person. And, like, all the game, like, the art is fucking gorgeous. Um, yeah. It, it's just, like, wicked cool, man. I if, if you have a free night, I recommend picking up Never Going Home. Uh, I think Wedding Games, I think anyone would have fun with this system. I'm glad you reminded me of that game because I really would like you to run it if it's if possible. Um, I don't I don't know. I know we're talking about leaving roll 20 anyways or whatever, but like um, it, it just sounded like it was a very good game. Um, I, yeah. I would personally really like to play that at some point. I um, would love to. We'll have to do it with that Tuesday group because <laughs> I don't think a certain member would like to play horror. Oh, that that's right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Speaking <clears throat> of speaking of which, um, and I know we've mentioned this a couple of times on the stream, Old Gods of Appalachia has a TTRPG game coming out. It's like this really awesome uh, horror anthology uh, podcast where they tell spooky stories based on hillbilly redneck uh, stuff from like the 1920s. It's got like, it's, it's this very cool aesthetic um, and they are uh, putting out this game. Corey very graciously got it for me for Christmas, but it's not here yet because it's a small you gotta wait till March. Yeah. I gotta wait till <laughs> I gotta wait till March. I'm sitting here twiddling my thumbs until then. But, um, yeah, all, all of this is to say, um, look for other games, like yeah. just look like find other neat shit. Like if you like fun, like kooky games, I got, it was like a $10 RPG called Molgoths versus Visigoths at <laughs> PAX Unplugged. It's dope as hell. And I want to run, <laughs> run it at some point. Um, but like the creators are out there and they've been out there this whole time. And if you can take one thing away from this clusterfuck with wizards of the coast, understand that these people don't deserve your money. It's a giant corporation that for the longest time has been catering to like these groups of nerds and people who love TTRPGs as being your friends and the only thing that's really happened with this new OGL is just that the mask temporarily slipped off. They yeah. were never, they were never your friends. Find small, uh, find small TTRPG creators. Again, I don't care if you play our game, but find somebody else who's doing something cool. You can go to like the, the TTRPG subreddit. Um, there's tons of online communities where you can search this stuff out um, please go check that shit out because it's way cooler than Dungeons and Dragons. At the very least, you'll play a different game for a little bit and you'll have a good time. I promise right. you. Um, okay. I, I don't need to be on a soapbox anymore. Um, do we have anything else we need to go over? No, I think we're good. Okay, cool. Cool. Um, well, that being said, thank you all so much for tuning in. Um, uh, we will not be back on Tuesday because again, we are still in the middle of this kind of play test spree. So, um, Steve, the eviscerators crew <clears throat> will be back, um, on Wednesday night at 6 PM Eastern standard time. So this time next week, thank you all so much for tuning in. Uh, and we will see you all later. Be safe. Have Bye. fun. Play fun games. Bye. Ghost.
get into combat and gets like bulky and like not in a good way, I think, for our table. Um, but like the lore and like the setting and like how regular roles and how things work, I'm like that is exactly the needle I want to thread. Like it's it's like Norse folk tales and stuff instead of being yeah. Like, you're not a grappler, so you're probably not going to know the grapple rules, that kind of thing. Like, yeah, I don't know. That's, that's probably the way to go. Also, like, I like that, like, your DC is built on your character sheet, right? Like, it, it, it's a D20 system. It's like, well, I have this and this, which gives me a 17, so I know what to roll under. You're not telling me what to roll under. I'm looking at my character sheet, and it's telling me. I have hand-walled rigged it before, but now it's built into your 